Hey, welcome to everyone. This is Autistic Energy Management, and I'm Heather Cook with Autism Chrysalis, and today is October 27th, 2023. Let's go ahead and get started. So just a few housekeeping details. Um, during this, you are welcome to participate with your camera off or on. Um, it's totally fine to have it off. I do not mind. You're welcome to move around, fidget, stim, tick, doodle, take notes, look away. Even if your camera's on, I don't mind if you don't aren't looking at it. Um, there's lots of ways to pay attention and please do what works for you. You'll notice I'll have a, a fidget in my hands every once in a while and I've got a blanket on my lap that helps my nervous system feel regulated. And there are a few Zoom options that you can adjust to your own comfort and desires. You can turn the chat on and off so that you can see it or not. Uh, totally fine if the chat wants to be its own conversation, but if you're not interested in that, you don't have to have that visible. You can turn the closed captions on and off. And if you don't like watching your little picture of yourself in the picture of yourself, if you scroll over that or tap on it in the upper right corner, there's three dots and you can click that and click hide self view if you do not want to see it. Um, and I would ask during the, the workshop, if you aren't intending to talk to the group to please leave your microphone off um, to have it on mute. That way we just reduce background noise because a lot of us have audio sensitivities. If you do want to talk to the group, go ahead and turn that on, audio on. Okay. Uh, all right. So the plan for today is I'm going to do a short intro, probably about two minutes or so. And then we're going to talk about energy management, like what the problem is, and then the basic fundamental idea of how to get out of it. We're gonna be talking about short-term strategies. That's gonna be the most most bulk of the, the time. And then my philosophy on how you break out of that cycle long-term to really get out of that, that cycle of always having too little energy to do either anything or enough or what you really want to do. Uh, and then at the end, uh, there'll hopefully be a little time for Q and A. It might run over and like have about an hour of intro dumping, honestly, <laughs> and then we'll have a little Q and A time afterwards for those who are able and willing to stay. Um, okay, I do want to reassure you that this is not a disguised sell sales pitch. I am not trying to to pitch my services here. This is just genuinely good information that I want to get out. Um, I do appreciate feedback so that I can make these workshops better. I do these a few times a year, the free ones, um, and the the link to that feedback form is there. It'll also be at the end of the, the workshop. And I appreciate your sharing the recording if you find it useful. Okay. So a little bit about me, I am Heather Cook. I'm autistic, I'm ADHD. I have a variety of sensory processing differences. I live with chronic pain from Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I've faced a lot of challenges in my life, including disability, poverty, trauma, and repeated burnouts. Um, I've also worked through enough of the things that have been holding me back and my like internalized adherence to the status quo that I've, been able to find different ways to do things in my life, things that work for my autistic brain and information processing systems that make my ADHD happy, that make my sensory systems happy, and that allow me to work and to build positive relationships with other people. And now I work as a, an autistic life coach, and I help other people to get to that point as well, not the way that I did it, but the way that works for you so that you can build your autism positive life. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I, I bring up this land acknowledgement every time 
because it's important to remember what's happened in the past because what happened, especially in this country, though in different ways throughout the world, um, is an, a really egregious example of how the misuse of power and the abuse of systems has detrimentally impacted and permanently altered many ways of life for the worse. Um, and in in the context context of energy, there are groups and individuals and systems and people who will try and drain your energy intentionally. But the fact that they're targeting us is proof that we have power. Otherwise, it wouldn't matter. They would be like, yeah, it's a fly on the wall. Why would I bother with that? We have power and we can pull it back. So my ability to talk to you today from where I live and work is because many people lost their homes, their culture, and their lives. And in this area, it's specifically the Omaha tribes, the Ponca, the Iowa, Ochoa, Missouri, Sauk, and Fox tribes. Okay. So um, I've been doing these, these free workshops for a couple of years now. And since the one on autistic burnout recovery, I've been trying to, to place them in the context of that framework that I presented there. And this is one of those elements, which is under energy management, um, which is like how to find your energy drainers and gainers how to get rid of what's getting in the way of your energy, how to rebuild reserves and being able to regulate that better in real time. So that's the idea of what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time today. Okay, one more personal note. What I'm presenting here um, is not just something that I heard about that sounded like a good idea or <laughs> not really your standard advice, often for energy stuff, it's directly coming out of my own experience because I've been in the depths of energy lows for extended periods of time, years at a time, in which like having even one thing on my schedule for the whole week meant my week was shot or having one thing to do that day was all I could manage. Sometimes it was a struggle simply to get out of bed and feed myself with poor quality food that was just reheated. And I've been there. I've been there for extended periods of time. And I've been gradually recovering from my last major burnout, which was 2015. It's the last time I burned out at all, but it was a huge one. And I'm now being able to work full time sustainably and actually have more energy now than I do than I did when I started this. It's possible. It can happen. And I'm not a fluke. This happens. Many people have been able to build this up. What it takes is, actually, I'm not going to get into that. That's what the whole next hour is about. But um, I'll, I'll admit that I still need a lot more rest than our capitalist and ableist ideals say that I should need. But I don't really care anymore. I need a lot of rest, but I'm also able to work a lot. But the amount I'm able to work is a whole lot less than than what I was able to do in burnout. I'm getting a whole lot more done now, even with how much I'm not doing. So. All right. So on to the content portion. Here's the ironic thing. This is the the kind of sad note before we get into the, the good stuff, is that you actually have to have a little bit of energy to do the things that will help you get more energy. I've tried to create this, this graph, but it's like five bars, looks kind of like a musical staff. And the bottom line is when your amount of energy is so low that rest is the only option. You can't do anything else. That's in like the depths of burnout or 
um, maybe like at the end of a really, really hard day, it doesn't even have to be a long-term burnout type thing, but it could just be, you did a lot of physical work that day and you're drained. So at that point, rest is the only option. You can't do anything else. And then a little bit higher than that, when you have just a little bit of energy, you have like the minimal viable amount of energy that you need in order to be able to do the things that will get you more energy. Then you get a little bit more energy and you're up to a point where I would call yourself reasonably functional. Like you can do the things that are necessary, but it's kind of hard, but you can manage. It's not great. You def just definitely don't want to be like that, like as a goal, but it's, you've got something to work with. Then a little bit higher than that, you can do a little bit more active types of restoration, things that it might take some energy to do, but you're likely to get more energy back from the process. And then the goal, like the top line, is when you have energy and you have reserves so that when something happens, you can deal with it and not be completely wiped out. You might be tired, but not like down to baseline again. And you're going to be going up and down between these different zones of energy. And, and that's normal. That's the process of rebuilding it. It's not just a straight line. It's going to be going up and down and up and down. And then something will happen and it'll pop it way down, but you'll be able to work your way up again. Um, is this making sense? Someone wrote in the chat, the top line sounds so alien to me right now. I get that. I really get that. Um, and for right now, that might be not the goal that you're working towards. You might be working towards a lower goal of just like have, being reasonably functional or having just a minimum viable energy. You know, someone wrote, it's not linear, but always moving forward. Yes. Okay, so where's your energy going? Here's, I just want to mention a few different categories of energy lows that are very common for autistics. Um, there's the burnout category, the shutdown or post meltdown lows. When you have a long term illness or or even a short term illness, that that's an energy drain, um, or other kind of chronic conditions um, that aren't necessarily illnesses, but it's just something that you have to deal with long-term. Those all take energy from you. And also simply being neurodivergent in a world that's set up for neurotypical capitalist and colonized standards, that's itself a type of energy drain. And it's a big category. Um, working through like identifying and working through ableist internalized ableism and internalized capitalism that's going to be a big part of getting your energy back we'll talk about that more in a few minutes okay so here's how I see the, the situation. One of the biggest ways that our energy gets drained is the disparity between the demands of our current system, that neurotypical capitalist colonized white supremacist system, and our real needs. And most of us have been told over and over and over throughout our entire lives that what we need is not relevant, it's not appropriate, it's not actually what we need. And, and we take that in and we learn to deny it ourselves. We say, oh, well, no one else needs this, so it must be just me. Or um, it's not okay for me to have needs. Or if anyone else has a need, then I have to override mine because that's how I function, that's how I find safety. And that disparity, that cognitive dissonance 
is itself an energy drain. When we believe one thing, but internally we genuinely know something else to be true, that disconnect is itself a major energy drain. I'm wondering if that's resonating for y'all. I'm seeing lots of yeses, yeah. I would argue that one of the easiest, uh, I wouldn't say easiest ways, but one of the least expensive and least time-consuming ways to get energy back is by recognizing that disparity and, and acknowledging it, giving it credence and saying, yeah, this is the situation. Here's what's actually happening. And it sucks. Whether or not you can do anything about it, simply acknowledging that and acknowledging this is true. Here's what's true in my life. That can give you some of your energy back. Hopefully at that point, you can also do something about it, even if it's tiny, tiny things. But even if you can't, Knowing what's true can bring back some energy. All right, so we, I mentioned like we've learned to override our needs. Um, we can each do that for so long before those effects of overriding our needs become unignorable. Some of us, this is simply not an option from birth. These are people who aren't able to mask, who generally have higher support needs. Their, their experience of the world is so very different from the, like the middle of the bell curve that it's so obvious they've got different needs and, and they can't deal with it too. Like they can't just ignore it very much. I would argue that they are still probably doing some of that, but not nearly as much as those of us who are, who are more able to mask. Um, but we all can do it to some extent. So maybe you started like burning out in high school, maybe in college, maybe after college, maybe you were able to to keep a job or a few jobs or a series of jobs for a while, but at some point it's just like the demands of the the system and the the corporate environment and all of that is just too much and you burn out at some point it's going to be to be get to a point where stimulants and sugar and pushing through and digging deep and all of that stuff it, it just doesn't work anymore your body can't respond to it because it's got nothing left to give you can't like yeah. So at that point, once you've reached that, things get more intense. This is where like you notice that you're autistic and all of a sudden everything gets more annoying. It bothers you more, even though it's like it hasn't changed. That's what's happening here is you're you're simply not able to to ignore it. So what you do is recalibrate to what your real needs are and accept that you may never meet those cultural ideals, but you get a whole lot more done than you would in burnout or in illness. It's going to look very different. And see, so at that point, once you've, you've gotten to that point of either burnout or chronic illness or depression or whatever it is for you, however it shows up in your life. And it can show up in a few different ways. Those are common ways. Um, unexplained chronic illnesses are another way that that can show up. Uh, major depression, etc. So once you've get, got to that point, you can't really go back. You can't go back to to pretending it was all okay. You can't just or at least not long-term. 
you might be able to to take some time off or or go to the doctor or they can give you some stuff that can help for a while maybe you feel like you're getting a little bit better for a while you manage to to go back to work get a new job whatever it takes and you work a little bit and then you're just back in burnout again once you've hit that it's just going to be a cycle of constantly going back to burnout or back to illness or back to depression or back to whatever the only way out of that cycle is by actually changing the the circumstances of what's going on so there's no way back but there is a way forward There's a way to, and what I'm going to, this is basically my, my premise here, is that the way out of that is not going back to your old self, the, the pre-burnout self, the one who had energy and could do all of the things and, and be a workaholic or change the world or whatever it was. Y you can't just go back to that version of yourself because that version of yourself wasn't living in a healthy way it was ignoring your own needs so you just have to start paying attention to what your needs are we don't have a lot of models for people who do this of breaking the the ties to to social normative standards but people are doing it every day this is what i've been doing for the last eight years of my life um, and lots of other people are doing it as well and so what I'm going to be moving into next is practical strategies, like how you actually do this. And there's two versions. There's the short-term and the long-term stuff. And ideally, you'll be able to toggle between the two because you need all the short-term stuff. And in order for it to not just be a, a quick fix that doesn't really fix it, but it looks like it fixes it, and then you're just like back in burnout again because it didn't really... Um, fix the act, the underlying situation. As you're doing those short-term things, if you start to incorporate these long-term de deconstructing the, the standard model cognitive paths and like the ways that you've been taught to hurt yourself and that other people are hurting you and reconstruct, constructing in new ways, um, doing both of those at the same time is going to be building your better life, a, a, a life that works for the way that your brain and nervous system process things for what you actually need. Okay, so that's my premise. How is this landing with people? From here on out, it's going to be just practical stuff, tips and tricks, strategies, that stuff. Getting a lot of makes sense. Yes. Rings true. This is great. Thank you. Okay. All right. So here's the basic idea of my short-term strategies, and I'm going to get into each one of these points more. So the basic idea is to find your energy drainers. Find the things that are draining your energy and minimize them where possible. Give yourself permission to not live up to other people's standards to cast off the things that you don't absolutely have to do. There's probably more of them than you, than you think. Let yourself rest. And if it helps, think of it as an act of defiance, because it is. Our PDA can be happy about that. When resting, disengage from think, thinking about all the things that you should be doing and feeling guilty about it, because that's not really resting. And then find the things that gain, that find your energy gainers, the things that bring you energy and maximize those where possible.
Okay. So let's look at each one of those individually. Okay. So here are a bunch of things that are common energy drainers for people in general, but especially for autistics. And I've, I've got two slides of these. This slide is the biological and environmental stuff. So some medications can, oh, I, I do want to put a disclaimer on this. I'm not actually saying that any of these things are bad or that you shouldn't use them. I'm simply saying that they tend to drain energy and you may choose to keep them as part of your life because you need them for something else that is a higher priority for you or because you don't have a way to get rid of it. Um, but just putting it out there that it, that's, these are things that drain energy. Okay, so some medications like anti-anxiety medications, um, pain meds, uh, antipsychotics, a fair amount of those also tend to drain energy. Not all of them, but you can look at, see the common side effects for the ones that you might be taking to see if that's where some of it's coming from. Um, exposure to allergens. When your body is fighting off allergy reactions from the outside world, it simply takes energy to do that. And it's good that we fight off things that our body is interpreting as, um, as a danger. That that's a system in our body that we want to have available. Sometimes it's a little bit over-enthusiastic. But anyway, it, it does take energy. Some medical or having medical conditions or chronic pain, those, again, take energy for your body to deal with those. Um, my own chronic pain is a big source of my energy drain. Um, fending off sensory input. So when our sensory environment is is something that our body has to actively regulate against, like fighting off the world around you, that takes energy. So if there's a lot of unneeded noises, minimizing those would be useful or putting on noise canceling headphones or ear defenders or um, earplugs, that's one way to, to minimize it. But like, just as an example, dealing with that audio input that is unpleasant or just too much or too many things going on, it simply takes energy to deal with that. Fluorescent lighting, that's one uh, sensory thing that I wanted to point out specifically because it is so ubiquitous, especially in public buildings and uh, and workplaces, stores, shopping centers, government buildings, all those kinds of places. It is so ubiquitous and so um, underrated how much it affects people, but it affects people so much that it's it's worth pointing out. When I go out into public buildings, I often wear, I have some red um, fluorescent light filtering glasses that it helps. It looks weird, but I don't care anymore because I can leave without a migraine. Okay, foods with low nutritional value. It might fill up your stomach, but it might not be giving you much nutrition for your body to be able to draw upon to give you energy. Um, also stimulants such as caffeine, alcohol, sugars, they can mask your true energy levels so that you think that you have more than you actually do, but it's not a nutritious kind of energy. Um, and also alcohol, weed, things that just depress your nervous system reactivity, those can draw energy. I do want to mention with like the alcohol, caffeine, weed, like there are reasons that we use those and those might be higher priorities in your life. Some people use them specifically because they depress nervous system reactivity so that the, the sensory world isn't as, as intense. I'm not saying 
don't do it. I'm just saying, recognize that it's an energy trainer. Okay. Here's some more energy drainers. These are more of the cognitive, social, and emotional energy drainers. Um, conflicting expectations. I mentioned that a little bit. I want to clarify here or, or make it more specific, narrow it down to conflicting expectations. Like one person wants you to do wants you to do one thing, but someone else wants you to do another thing. And you're kind of accountable to both of them. That tension is going to cause an energy drain. Um, unhealed trauma in your life is a source of energy draining. Um, unacknowledged physical or un or emotional pain. We all I talked earlier about like chronic pain, whatnot, physical pain causing an, an causing an energy drain unacknowledged physical pain or also unacknowledged emotional pain is another huge source of energy draining toxic relationships or abusive relationships where someone is unpredictable even after you've gotten to know them or they're demanding inappropriate things of you or um there's constant emotional assaults, all sorts of different ways that people can be toxic or abusive. But those, you're constantly on edge having to try and navigate an impossible situation. Like, how do I not set this person off when th there's there's no right answer to that? Because it changes constantly. Or what they're expecting of you, you cannot physically do or you do it and they're still not happy. Like that's an impossible situation and that is an energy drain. Um, dissociating. This is often start, starts as a reaction to trauma and as a way to get through a traumatic situation or either a specific one or a long-term traumatic environment. And that is a healthy, useful reaction in those kinds of situations. When it becomes your everyday experience, even after the toxic situation or the, excuse me, the, the traumatic situation or environment has long ended, um, it's no longer a useful, healthy thing in your life but turns into an energy drain. Um, and there are ways to heal that with a, a, a with a good therapist who's a good match for you that can be healed and integrated. Um, not saying that you're ready for that or want that, just saying that that dissociation is as a source of energy drain. Um, on that note, I want to mention like maladaptive daydreaming, what people call maladaptive. I'm not sure I love that. I, I don't really love that term, but whatever. Um, I've engaged in that since I was young. And it wasn't until I've been in this healing journey the last eight years or so that I have was actually able to notice that that was an energy drain because it's just been such a part of my life that I never had a real comparison, like a, a before after kind of with or without comparison. And I still do it some. It's a whole lot less than it used to be. It used to be a, a large chunk of my life, but now it's just a little bit here and there when I'm like my pain flares up or I'm extra stressed out about something. Um, but now, because it is much less common, like it's it's not a big part of my life, I notice that when I do it, my energy just drops, it plummets. And that was really interesting for me to notice. I never thought about that before. I'm not sure if that's a usual experience. I just wanted to put that out there. Um, so also, all or nothing thinking is a big energy drain because it's 
it's basically putting yourself between a rock and a hard place. It's either this or that, like there's no other options. There's no other possibilities. There's no, um, not just gray areas, but like there's no other paths at all. And that can be very difficult because those two options may not be viable options for you. Um, uh, unfamiliarity or unpredictable situations. It's an energy drain. Like going to a new place or meeting someone new and you're not sure what to expect or trying a new healing technique or whatnot. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's simply an energy drain. And I will mention that in the course of building your autism positive life, leaving behind things that you're familiar with that are comfortable, even if you don't like them, but you're used to them, that brings up a lot of of feelings of, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to expect. This is unfamiliar. I just don't like that. And that's not, they're not necessarily bad things, but recognize that that's going to take a little bit of extra energy and you might want to plan to do those kinds of healing things at times when you have a little energy to manage. Also large amounts of screen time, completely apart from the content. It's like staring directly at a light bulb for hours. Your phone actually emits a lot of light. And it's not like you can notice it more at night when like you, you're watching someone else and you can see the the light from their phone in the dark, like bathing them in light, but you don't notice it yourself. And you don't notice it so much during the day because there's so much ambient light, but it is still staring at a light bulb. Also news or social media content that increases anxiety, fear, or negativity all of those drain energy. I'm not saying anything about like whether you should or shouldn't watch news. I'm just saying it it drains energy. Okay. Those are the things that I wanted to mention. There was a a question about ADHD meds. Let me read this. Um, what about stimulants used as ADHD meds in relation to the, the medicine energy drain? So any kind of stimulant is going to artificially mask your true energy levels. You, now, things that give you those kinds of energy whether it's ADHD stimulants or um, steroids or sugars or whatever it is that that give you energy. Those are short-term boosts, but they take other kinds of energy out of your body in order to perform whatever it is you're doing. Um, So you might feel like you have energy, but doing the thing that you're doing getting up and going to exercise or breaking the leaves or whatever it is that you're doing requires your entire body to use nutrients to to do that it's you're using nutrients water um all sorts of things like all the things that it takes your body to to perform so not saying that this that the ADHD meds are bad They are very helpful for a lot of people in terms of being able to focus or to get through the day or whatnot. I'm simply saying that look at whichever one you're taking. They're not all the same. And I don't know all the details about all of them. I don't want to pretend that I do. But one of the factors that you might want to consider is what it's doing to your energy levels. And also people are going to respond differently. So Like test it on yourself with and without the meds. How do you feel? Mm -hmm. All right. So moving on. Another short-term strategy 
is to give yourself permission to not live up to other people's standards. Those are family standards, social conventions, common expectations around college, marriage, career, kids, that kinds of things, what types of work are possible, how to do them. Um, so some standards are are useful and good. Like some of them became that way because they they're useful, they work. But some of them are social conventions that don't really necessarily mean much. And you get to choose which ones you want to stick stick with or not. Just because people, at, at least in our modern, educated, Western, weird world, because you're supposed to go to school, then go to college, then have a career, get married, have kids. Like, you don't have to do all of that. And you don't have to do it in the same ways or in the same orders. Um, and it's not a personal failing if you don't have kids or if you don't get married or if you don't get married in the, the ways or to the people that society has proclaimed as appropriate. Um, but spend some time picking apart what expectations that other people have of you or that society has drilled into you. Like, which one of those do you want to have in your life? Which ones don't you? Just as an example of, of family expectations, an appropriate expectation would might be spending time with them. An inappropriate expectation would be spending all of your time with them. Um, it's okay to flaunt social conventions, especially when it doesn't hurt other people. Some social conventions, like thou shalt not murder, are useful. Social conventions like thou shalt use a fork to eat. Well, so what? Like, th there's a difference between those, but some people treat them as, like, this again, this is all or nothing thinking. Like, you have to follow all of the social rules, or otherwise you're a bad person. And sometimes you just, you don't. It's not that big of a deal. Forks are useful if it's spaghetti, but if it's fish sticks, you can use fingers. Like, if you don't like the sound of silverware on plates, because that's a sensory thing for some people, it is for me, use plastic forks or bamboo or like, there There are alternatives is my point, is that you don't have to take all social norms as law. <sighs> okay. I could rant on that for hours. I'm not going to. <laughs> Another practical tip is to find the things that you don't actually have to do and let them go. Like, If you go through your to-do list and it might feel like every single thing on there is absolutely essential. And there might be times in your life where that's absolutely true. But I'll bet you that most of the time, there are some of those things that feel more needed than they actually are, that you might be able to let some of those go. And even if you can let go of a few of the little ones, that can free up a little bit of energy. So one idea is to go through your to-do list and question every single item. And you can ask yourself, what would happen if I didn't do this? And am I willing to live with that? There might be consequences to it, but you might be more willing to live with it than to do it. Or could someone else do this instead? And if they're not just straight up willing to do it for you, could you maybe trade with someone else? Like do a job for them that they don't like, but you don't mind. And they do this job for you that they don't mind, but you don't, but yeah, you don't like. Like, in my household, um, my mom and I live together and she does most of the in-person shopping because she doesn't mind that. She kind of likes it. I absolutely hate it. Absolutely cannot stand it. Um, but I do almost all of the online shopping because she doesn't like that, but I don't mind it. So that works. 
So I'll do her online shopping, even when it's stuff that I don't need to do because she goes grocery shopping for me. Another thing you can ask yourself about items on your to-do list is, is there a way that you could do it that would make it a little bit more pleasant or a little bit less draining, even if you have to do it, but can you just set it up in a way that it's a little bit less sucky? Can you make yourself more comfortable in the process? Um, can you listen to music while you're doing it? Listen to an audio book. Can you get a more comfortable chair if it's something that is sitting stationary? Can you um, put out some essential oils so that the room smells not nice, something that you like? Um, can you do it while taking care of something else that, um, yeah, I mean, like, just make the experience a little bit nicer. It'll drain a little bit less energy. All right. So another strategy is to let yourself rest. Um, if it helps, think of resting as an act of defiance against the system or the man or whatever, because it is. Our capitalist culture tells us that we're supposed to be working constantly and that you're not allowed to rest. You need to push through, you need to power through, whatever. But you don't, not most of the time anyway, there's times in life where that's true, but most of the time you have you can carve out some amount of rest. But resting is, is more than just not working. It's also not fretting, not worrying, not engaging in replays of painful interactions over and over on looping your head, not engaging in anxious thoughts, not allowing in other energy drainers. So if you replace one energy drainer with just another one, it doesn't really, it, that's not really the point. Um, okay, so... Yeah, if you're just sitting there and trying to rest, but you're just going on and on in your mind about all the things that you should be doing and you're feeling super guilty about not getting stuff done or about looking like you're not being productive or what if someone catches you sitting or whatever it is, um, those are just my things. Um, some techniques for disengaging from those thoughts are the work of Byron Katie. I really love hers acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT tools. Those are by Stephen Hayes. And some of the mindfulness approaches, some aren't relevant to this, but some are great. Uh, also working with a good therapist or a coach who specializes in this kind of thing, this is kind of my wheelhouse, um, can help you. Because I know it's not just as simple as just not thinking about that stuff, but these are some some ways that you can disengage from those thoughts. Also, acknowledging that rest will simply take longer for us than social norms expect. For many autistics and ADHDers, we need a lot more rest for our nervous systems to process, to downregulate, to actually feel rested. But there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with you. That's simply normal for us. And planning that into your schedule doesn't create later situations where you've overscheduled something because you're not acknowledging how much energy it or how much rest time it'll actually take you to recuperate from something and then you're backing yourself into a corner with some other commitment that you've made down the line so plan it in when i was starting this i literally plan i put it on my schedule like recuperation time was planned into my schedule for an hour to three hours, depending on the thing, or for the rest of the day after every single appointment. And it was useful for me to have it on my schedule because it it was like permission to myself to be able to do that. And when you can't, there are times in life and situations where you're simply not going to be able to carve out actual rest time. 
So during those times, what you can do is focus on relieving that cognitive dissonance or painful thoughts or anxiety, because those don't take any extra time in your day. Maybe learning the techniques might take a little bit, but it's very, very small compared to large amounts of dedicated rest time. But once you've learned a few techniques, um, you can use them as you're going about things. It doesn't take any extra time. And also loosening all or nothing thinking. Same thing what I just said. You can focus on attaching meaning to physical sensations and emotions. I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. You can focus on making the experience of the things that you do have to do slightly better, as I just mentioned, improving your sensory experiences and increasing self-compassion. And self-compassion can be as simple as acknowledging, yeah, this really does take me more than it takes other people. And that's not a problem with me. That's simply how I work. And it's an acknowledgement of how crappy the system is and what it expects of us. But I'm okay with who I am. So those are things that you can do that don't really take hardly any extra time. And they don't take dedicated, like large chunks of dedicated time at all. And most of those don't take any expenses either. Okay. And then the last point I want to talk about with these short-term strategies is some examples of energy gainers. So again, I've got two slides here. These are the biological and environmental energy gainers. They include lessening your environmental stressors so that you don't have to waste energy fighting off the world around you. Increasing physical movement that doesn't cause pain or injury for those of us, excuse me, for those of us who um, deal with a lot of um, of chronic pain or who injure very easily, be careful about it. But if it's simply just like moving your fingers a little bit or moving an arm or wiggling your toes, um, there, your capillary system in your body doesn't pump let me start that over. Your arteries push the blood out and pull it out, pull it back to your heart. But the capillary system in your body works by the muscle contractions of the muscles around the capillaries. The blood goes in and out of the capillary system by your muscles moving and not otherwise. So in order to oxygenate all of the different parts of your body, all of the different parts of your body need to move because that oxygen is carried in the blood and that is only pumped to all the different parts through physical movement. So when you move more, it will oxygenate more of your body and you will feel better physically and that will give you energy. Okay, another source of energy gain is wanted physical contact with other people. Um, not all physical contact, but when you enjoy it, when you like it, when you want it. Um, breathing from your belly as opposed to your chest. Uh, chest breathing is, there's nothing wrong with it, um, but it does less to oxygenate your, uh, your blood than your belly breathing. So that's another way to get more oxygenated blood through out your entire body. Um, if you do breathe primarily or only into your chest as your, your default, I would be curious if you also happen to have a trauma history or a stress history, because it's a very common response to that. Not the only reason, but I'd be curious. Um, vitamins and supplements can add more nutrients into your diet than is possible to get through our food systems. Our food systems have far less nutrient density nowadays than they ever have in history. Um, engaging with animals, for a lot of people, that's a great energy boost. It, it 
brings up oxy oxytocin, it feels good. And any kind of nature connection, either being in a natural setting, physically in it, or looking at it through windows, having house plants, even fake plants or pictures of videos or of landscapes or animals, feels good. It, it releases feel good hormones and that gives you natural energy. And naps, even short naps in the middle of the day, 15, 20 minutes, um, that can help you recover so that you're not just struggling for the rest of the day. I'm a big fan of naps. Okay. All right. I'm noticing that we are up to the hour that I mentioned. I am through most of this, but if you do need to leave, totally fine. The rest will be available in the recording. Um, okay. So Com other common energy gainers. These are the more cognitive, social, and emotional ones. Creativity, play, art, engaging in special interests, things that you enjoy doing. Those are all great sources of energy gains because they engage your right side of the brain more fully and it lowers the anxiety. It lowers painful thoughts. It decreases all or nothing thinking. It opens up possibilities and using both sides of your brain um, is, is a way to increase energy because you're all working together better. Curiosity is one way that you can engage that very easily. Even interestingly, in the sorts of, in the face of pain and things that you hate, it's like, if you can think, that's interesting. I wonder why that is that way. That system really, really sucks. It is totally damaging. I wonder how it got to be like that w without the judgment, but just like genuine curiosity. I'm like, why is it like that? Wow, he said something really hurtful. I wonder where he's coming from. I wonder what thought process would have made that a logical thing for him to say. You don't have to agree with it. Just having curiosity about it can open up different ways of responding that might be less energy draining. Um, it also works with pain, interestingly. Like, my hip is hurting a lot right now. And I'm just like, huh, that's interesting. What kind of pain is that? What's the quality of the pain? Is it burning, pulsing, rubbing? stinging this is more like a solid solid steady pain like where is it specifically it's in that spot okay maybe i could move that a little bit i did that just a couple minutes ago i moved my position and it felt a little bit better okay establishing positive connections with others just engaging in positive ways with other people is is a source of energy Relieving cognitive distance, I, dissonance. I talked about this earlier. That is a major source of energy gain. One of the biggest ones in my experience. Naming emotional experiences, being um, developing emotional granularity. So if you can name an emotional experience, not just it was bad or it was awful or I'm upset, but like what kind of upset are you? Are you this website won't let me log in kind of upset or the dog went on the carpet kind of upset. Like, like what is the actual quality of your emotional experience? Can you name it? Can you give, can you label it? Being able to do that actually gives you energy because it pulls you out of being so wrapped up in it that you have to become sort of an observer to it at least partially, and be able to process it. And that pulling away from it disengages some of it, but without dissociating. It's it's simply observing yourself in, in a situation in a healthy way. And that can give you energy. Healing old emotional wounds or old traumas is a huge source of energy gain. 
I'll admit that that one also does take some energy to get there and it may not be, well, it's definitely not going to be comfortable, but the comfort comes later because you feel better later. Um, that one's hard. I'll admit that. Um, but it, it does give a lot of energy back. Or simply understanding what's going on in a situation or figuring out a solution to the problem. I always love it when I can figure out a solution to a problem. It's like, yes, I figured that out. Got that. And I get this little boost of energy. I love it. Okay. All right. So I want to talk uh, Oh, a couple more. I forgot about this. A couple more short-term strategies. In the signups, a lot of people were asking, like, how do I get out of situations? How do, how do I get out of socialization? Or how do I explain to other people what are going on? So I want to talk a little bit about that. So how do you explain what's going on when other people just don't get it? And our modern ableist capitalist narratives around productivity and worth are so strong. And many people are so internalized, have so internalized them that they don't understand why you can't just push through. Uh, especially that's true when they have an agenda, like the school needs to get through a curriculum. The teacher has 30 kids in the room and they all have different needs. And we just, she just needs everyone to be quiet and get to work. Um, or your work has goals that they need you to do and they don't really care about how you feel about it. They just want you to do the job. Or family and friends, this can be an issue, especially if they recharge in different ways than you do. Like they wanna go out and do things and be active on the weekends. And you're like, I just wanna sit here alone and read and like do nothing. And could you go in a different room now, please? I don't want you around. I love you, but I don't want you here. And you really wanna say that, but like, you can't or you don't want to. Okay, so here's the general formula. Um, rule of thumb is to explain what the difficulty is, what the impact of that difficulty is, and then if possible, make it relevant to the other person. People will tend to be more on board with things if you can more or less follow this. And I've got a bunch of examples. <clears throat> So examples in family situations, I will add the caveat before I read these out that um, this is how I talk. I genuinely talk like this. People around me are used to it, so they don't think it's weird. But if this is not how you talk, it's probably not. Um, you can use this as a, as a model, as a guide, or as ideas for things that could be said, but say it in your own way you have like full permission and encouragement to tweak this as much as you like. Um, hopefully it'll just give you some ideas. Okay, so in family situations, you might say something like, the pandemic made me realize how much I've been ignoring my real needs for years. I wanna put the important things first, like health and us. And that may look different than what it's been before, but please believe that I care about you. Or, oh. I don't have all this autism stuff, this burnout, unmasking, personal journey, whatever you're calling it. I don't have it all figured out yet. And I know that that's scary or uncomfortable. I'm scared, uncomfortable too. What if we work together to figure it out? Another example is, I've worked really hard for a really long time to not be bothered by whatever it is you're bothered by because I thought that everyone felt like I did and I just had to put up with it. But it's taken a lot out of me and the truth is that it really does hurt. Can we find some alternatives so that I have energy left for us or I have energy left to be less grumpy or whatever the benefit is to them? And one more is, um, you might say, I've been burning the candle at both ends or pushing too hard or overdoing it for so long, it's catching up to me and I get wiped out so easily now. I just need some time, but, and then whatever the, the relevance is to them. Someone asked to see the last slide again for a moment. Okay, so those are some ideas, some ideas of, 
how you might explain this to family members. Okay, so for work situations, you might say, I've realized that I can't keep pushing myself so hard without paying for it. So I need to pull back a little or take some time off to restore or compensate for that now so that I can keep working because I want to be here long-term. Or I've been going through a lot lately. I don't wanna get into the details, but I wanna reassure, want to reassure you that I want to keep working but I might need a little flexibility. Could we talk about some options? Or I'm the kind of person who gets distracted very easily and needs a fidget to be able to pay attention to you. Notice you're, you're putting in that relevance to them to be able to pay attention to you. Or I'm the kind of person who will get more done and do it better when I'm left to work alone. Could we talk about ways to make that happen? Or I'm the kind of person who has a hard time tuning out things going on around me. Could we talk somewhere quieter so that I can focus on our meeting? Hoping this is giving some ideas. All right, and then one more set of examples. These are for school things. And you can make this either for yourself if you're the one in school or for your kid, if you're advocating for someone else. We were surprised that when we tried this thing, it really helped my kid to take in the material and retain it much better. How could we integrate that without creating much more work for you? In this, I'm imagining talking to the teacher. Or the pandemic made it more clear how differently my kid learns. They do much better when whatever it is happens. Can we talk about ways to make that possible here? Here as in the school. Um, or... I or my kid is the kind of person who needs to move to focus. When I'm fidgeting, I'm not distracted. I'm listening better. So explaining like what's going on, I'm not distracted. I'm listening better. That helps them to not make assumptions that are wrong and damaging. Or I'm the kind of person who reacts more intensely to common things like other kids talking, the toilet flushing, bright lights, and they need more time to settle down again. They're not trying to be difficult. They're just struggling or they're having a hard time. Okay, so I hope that those will help. And one more bit on the examples of things to say. This is how to get out of socializing without coming across as rude, hopefully. And it's only hopefully because everyone's going to respond to things differently and you can never completely predict absolutely how someone is going to see it. Okay, someone asked to see the family slide again. There you go. These will also be available in the recording. You can look back through it. All right. So my general advice on the socializing thing is to um, is to give some general explanations in advance when you have the energy, so that in this in the moment it doesn't look like you're making excuses and the other person doesn't make false assumptions, like they're interpreting it as rude when it's just you don't have energy or they're interpreting it as disinterest when you really are interested, but you just don't have energy. So in advance of the, like them inviting you to something, you might say something like, um, I really do wanna spend time with you. And right now, everything takes more energy than I have. I'm gonna pass this time, but please keep inviting me. That shows that you are interested and you do want to maintain contact, it's just you genuinely don't have energy. I had a friend, a really good friend of mine who did this for me for about two years. Almost every week for two years, she would invite me to a dance class. And I wanted to go, but I had, I was in burnout. It wasn't gonna happen.
but she kept inviting me and we had to talk about it. And I asked her to keep, please keep inviting me. I never actually went, but for as long as she went to the dance class, she kept inviting me. And it was just maintaining that connection between us was, was a good thing. And later on, after I got out of burnout, it turned into something else. We did start meeting up more or less sort of weekly, but at her house, not in the big group setting. And that worked out really well. But I had the energy at that time to do that. I didn't before. Okay, one other example is you might say to someone, if I don't text back right away, it's probably just that I don't have the energy and I don't know how to say that because I don't want to disappoint you because I care about you. Okay. So those are my strategies and tips and tricks for the short-term stuff. I want to focus on the long-term just briefly. This is not actually going into depth in this. And we've probably got about 10 minutes left, max. Okay, so the long game. Here's the overview. This is what, in my experience, it takes to really get out of the cycle so that you can consistently and reliably have a reasonable amount of energy with reserves and to protect that while still getting to do the things that you want and need to do. Again, it's not going back to the old standards of being able to do everything at capitalist ideals. That's that's unrealistic long-term. But the goal is to be able to going from not really being aware of what your current energy states are or your needs or your wants to being able to respond to them appropriately in real time. And here's the fundamental tenet underlying my philosophy on this. A large percentage of my clients and of the questions that I get around energy and of the questions that were submitted before this workshop in the sign up are basically people saying that I don't know how to tell how much energy I have. I don't know how to, I, I don't have a connection to my body. I don't know how much. I'd overdo it and I pay for it later, later variations on that. And I get it. I was there. I was there for most of my life. Um, and the situation is that either people don't have internal awareness, it's numbed, it's ignored, it's disconnected in some a variety of ways, or they have so much in, uh, awareness of it, but it's not useful awareness. Like they're hypersensitive to all sorts of feelings in their body, but it's not making meaningful connections to something that's useful as an information source. So what, what I believe you need to do is to establish useful, reliable feedback to what's going on inside your body in real time so that you can tell how much energy you have and what you need so that you can give your body the nutrients that it needs, the, the rest that it needs, the awareness of what's going on, um, and and be able to to use that it also by the way is useful for making decisions in your life for being able to to tell when people are not safe people you get awareness of like what are the red flags in a situation or with a person it has lots of other useful um side effects but here we're talking about energy it's the way you get energy So why, why body stuff? Why do like, if physical sensations and emotions seem non-relevant to you, like they did to me for most of my life, why should you bother with this? So here's the idea. If any system or machine or group or person can tell you exactly what it needs to be able to operate efficiently, that's relevant info. If your computer tells you that it's low on battery, or it needs a system update, you plug it in or you update the thing. If your car gives you a warning light saying the tire pressure is low or you need to change the oil or there's an issue in the engine, it's nicer to find that out when it's at the point of warning lights, not the point of your car stopping and like it won't go anymore. Your body gives those kinds of warning lights too in the forms of 
dehydration or hunger, thirst, thirst before dehydration, ideally, um, hunger, need, the feeling of needing to go to the bathroom, of being overtired, being able to tell the difference between being tired and sleepy. Like there's a whole range of, of physical responses that you can get useful information out of. And as you do, you can gather data points about how things are affecting you in real time. Like this person is saying things that I'm noticing a physical reaction to. Maybe that's useful information about this person is an okay person or a not okay person to be around. Or maybe I want to speak up about a topic or um, I'm noticing that I'm like resisting doing a particular task. If you notice that, you can start questioning, like get into the curiosity mode of what is it about this task that is that I'm having an issue with? It's generally not the whole thing. There's usually one or two specific things. If you can figure that out, um, then you can you can use that information to solve those particular issues. And then all of a sudden the whole um, problem is like, oh, okay, I can do that now. Now that I've got this one or two things taken care of, it's just not a big deal anymore. That's where a lot of procrastination comes from, by the way. There's something in there that's bothering you and you're not able to respond. Like if you can figure out what that thing is, then the, the pro procrastination goes away. Okay. So the, the basic idea of the long-term stuff is reintegrating your physical experiences. It's not easy and it's not quick. It took me years and was sometimes deeply uncomfortable, but it made life so much easier afterwards. And it's so much better. Okay, so here's the, the overview. And I'm not gonna get into all of these in depth. It's just this one slide. And then we're gonna wrap up. Um, <laughs> Okay, someone's asking in the in the chat, do I have a course on that body stuff? Uh, no, but I have thoughts of creating one in the future. It's going to be integrated into my, my burnout recovery course, by the way, because it's simply a part of the burnout recovery. Okay, so here's the top-down overview. And I've laid these out in a series of six steps, but you're going to be going back and forth between them. It's not a perfectly linear thing. But it starts with recognizing various physical experiences and starting to attach useful meaning to that internal awareness. Uh, and then healing at least some of your trauma history. It doesn't have to be all of it. You don't have to go full force all of it at once. That can be overwhelming. Um, and then unmasking and undoing some of your internalized ableism, some of your internalized capitalism, other um, cognitive dissonance, other painful thoughts, and integrating your own values more fully into how you're living your life. Learning to use your internal awareness and emotions as information sources, and slowly, gradually getting better at interpreting your cognitive signals, emotional signals, and physical signals in real time. And again, you're going to be going back and forth between these a lot, but that's the general light overview. All right. So let's wrap this up. No one else will ever be able to reliably and consistently know what you need at all times because they only have the outward markers of your needs, which are limited and can be misleading. There's lots of internal states that are very, very different, but that can look the same on the outside. And if people are just seeing those outside signals, they're not getting all of the information, but you have access to that. And getting access to that involves establishing trust with yourself. And you do that by establishing a healthy relationship with your body, dissolving harmful messages, learning to trust your own evaluation of your needs, and practicing your ability to respond to them without damaging relationships with other people, at least the relationships that you want to keep. Some relationships are worth letting go. Um, and that might be a way to regain energy. 
I'm thinking of toxic or abusive people specifically. Okay, and my closing thought is something that I realized in my own journey, which is that not all activity is productive and not all productivity is active. And what I mean by that is that you can be looking like you're doing a lot of things, but getting actually very little useful stuff done. And you can also look like you're not doing much. You're just sort of sitting there, but you're processing a lot internally or you're resting, which is a productive thing to do. I remind myself of this frequently. I have it on my phone. Okay, so that's that's my workshop. That's what I wanted to share with you today. I do very much appreciate some feedback on this. Um, I'll put the link to the the chat, or I'll put the link to the feedback form in the chat. Thank you, Coin. Um, oh, and I wanted to do the poll for the next workshop. Well, I'm getting that set up. Here's my contact, contact info if you want to contact me. Um, all right, and I do have a quick poll for if you're still around, you can help me choose the um, the topic of the next free workshop. So hopefully you'll see those on your screen now. Ooh, exciting. Mm -hmm. This was wonderful, by the way, Heather. Thank you. You're so welcome. I'm glad it's useful. Oh, hit me in the heart. It's not always the easiest stuff to hear. No, but I'd prefer truth over manipulation and grotesque abuse you know any mm -hmm. day this is a little more fun yeah yeah that's kind of my point with the whole cognitive dissonance like truth even when it's uncomfortable truth even when it's unpleasant truth is often easier than lies how do i oh good i get to do multiple oh my god yeah, i was you can do multiple all of this i'm like ooh, hmm Gosh, I can't, I, it's hard to prioritize. Well, how many do I get to pick? I, I think you can pick as many as you want. Oh, dang. <sighs> yeah, you can click them all. I clicked them all. <laughs> oh. yeah. There we go. I didn't click two. That's all right. Yeah, so that was my discernment. You don't have to like everything that I'm interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I always, you know, I've I've had some medical trauma around uh, therapists though, so I'm always like, ee, but I've been having great success with like coach coaches, but financially, yeah, it's a stinger. It is. We gotta I get so wish that go. coaching would be covered by insurance. Right. Okay. Let's... I would go through all of the hoops and do all the paperwork in order to be able to take insurance, but it's simply not covered. I know that's the screwed up thing, but they're having yeah. record profits and that's what, and we're suffering because we don't have enough advocacy, yeah. but you know who does like the blind folks, they get some great advocacy. I mean, just even modeling after some of their structures because yeah, it's a little behind here. Well, yeah. everywhere. All right. The blind Good. people have been around for longer, haven't they? I, well, they've admittedly been, I mean, it's a little easier to tell. You can, you don't see it, you know, it's physical ones are usually, that's what uh, they, they'll allow. I mean, I just called my local disability network and the only offerings I could get were uh, in the realms of physical for accommodations or any kind of services. Uh, I had to call uh, the police this week and um, I couldn't hear them because of all the background noise and constant like crazy sounds and they couldn't accommodate me either. So it's just a crazy world that's not built for people like us, but we can rebuild it. So with your help, of course, in some kind of project management. <laughs> I'm a project manager. Let's do it. <laughs> Well, maybe yeah. after we've got some energy back hey yeah yeah so i do want to open up if anyone had last questions yeah um, i 
I did have one for you, Heather. Um, sure. I'm not as familiar with the terminology cognitive dissonance. So could you explain a little bit more about what that actually is? So cognitive dissonance is a term in psychology which refers to um, the disparity between trying to hold two conflicting thoughts in your head at the same time. Trying to put it into these terms, it might be something like, I should work full time and I have medical or physical or burnout reasons why I cannot do that, but I should. And holding yourself to that standard of being able to work full time while you physically genuinely cannot is, is creating a problem in your head because I should be able to do this thing. I'm expecting myself to be able to do this thing, but I cannot do this thing, but everyone expects me to do this thing. And like, you're, you're stuck between trying to believe that something is true. That is not true. Like I should be able to do this. That should mm -hmm. be true, but it's not true. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's actually a perfect example. I'm living that right now. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Almost any kind of should is a disguise for something that is trying to believe or pretend to be true that is not true. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Okay, so earlier you said um, knowing the truth about the disparity between you and neurotypical society can give you energy. Um, I don't see that. I find that quite depressing and yeah. it makes me feel quite low. So okay. how, do totally you, how do you find, did I misunderstand or? No, there's two different ways that that can go. And one of the ways is, oh, wow, this really sucks. This is depressing. Nothing's ever going to change. It's awful. Um, there's another way that you can go with it, which is something closer to, oh, wow, this is a standard that is entirely unrealistic for me. It is hurting me. What my actual truth is, is that I will never be able to live up to that standard. Let me try and find a way to be able to still work and contribute, however you want to define that, that I enjoy, that works for me. And just saying that that capitalist standard is not a healthy thing. Okay. So yeah. you're really you're really saying, um, I know the truth now. How do I make it work for me? Yeah. Rather than making it into a huge mountain of something I can't get over, kind of. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So someone else wrote in, how can I prioritize when I'm in the rest or minimum viable energy stays, states? How to prioritize, prioritize the things. Are you talking about prioritizing like my gigantic to-do list or what types of rest or improvement are better for me? How can I avoid uh, doing sorry, energy? Sorry, uh, I jump in there, try to clarify. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, what do I mean? Yeah, it's just prioritizing the good things to try to aid my recovery from burnout in my case or or to aid uh, avoiding burnout <laughs> if, right. you, if somebody is well. Uh, if, you're, if I'm on um, the rest net, the two bottom rungs of your fence mm -hmm. <laughs> diagram, um, yeah, how do I make the choices? And I okay. sort of added another question, which is a follow-up to that, which is, um, you know, today's an example for me where I, I've i done very well of getting some basic stuff done, but then I realized, oh, yeah, the things that I want to do, like, uh, for example, play piano, you know, mm -hmm. I, I like to play piano, but I it's now late at night here. I'm in Germany. Um, and But then because I, between being really tired and trying to get some basic stuff done, I ran out of it 
sort of ran out of the time to <laughs> do some of the things that might actually, you know, add a bit of uh, shine and polish to my life. Right. Okay. So the first question was, how do I prioritize what things can help me get off of those two bottom rungs? Did I remember that correctly? Yes, I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, to try to okay. get to the stage of reasonable energy. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So two thoughts on that. First of all, don't put too much effort into trying to prioritize the best thing. Just pick anything. Anything that feels within your capacity. Because there's not like one particular path that if you don't do it, it's not going to work. If you can do anything that helps you get up a little bit, that's that's the best thing that you can do. Um, my second thought on that is prioritize the, like when you're coming down to it, prioritize the things that you have the capacity for. And those might be the things on that slide of when you don't have the ability to rest that don't take much energy. So like sorting out internalized ableism doesn't take a lot of energy. It takes a bit of a school skill set, um, but um, or like um, going through your the things that you have to do and saying like, do I really have to do that? Am I willing to live with not doing that? Whatever the consequences are, and just being okay with it. I there there is more on that that slide, but I would go back, look at, you can see it on the recording, but look for those things because those take very, very little energy. And if you can do them while you're lying on the couch, doing nothing. Your second question was, I ran out of stuff, ran out, ran out of energy by the end of the day and I can't do the things that I want to do because I did all the things that I had to do. Um, Sometimes that's going to happen. That's just the reality of life. But if you can like, try and build in moments during your day or a little bit here and there of doing the things that you like earlier in your day, you don't have to always put it off to the end of the day to do your piano or to do your art or to do your whatever it is that you like. Uh, try and like wake up to the piano wake up to the thing that you want to do or do it a little bit earlier or do it during a lunch break or do it, do it during, during times of the day that you have a little bit of energy. That's not going to help you today because you're about to go to bed, but in the future. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the answers. Yeah. There's, okay. Um, I can try. Yeah. I can. Uh, um, yeah. Some days are, it's always a mixed bag. Um, yep. yeah, like today, well, yeah, specifically for today, it was a chase of having a bit more energy. So I was saying, oh, I've got these things have been, my mm -hmm. house is a mess, for example, I've got to get do it, get through it. But yep. on other days, yeah, maybe now things are more clear Then I can think, oh yes, I'll, I'll put a bit of time into doing some music in the middle of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Hank was Heather? Yeah. Um, just a quick question. Um, one of my biggest problems is I'm, I do carry a lot of baggage and a lot of really bad things, but the thing that gets me the most is OCD. And that takes a lot of energy. And I'm having a hard something... time hearing you. I'm going to turn my volume up. I'm just saying that OCD takes a lot of energy, a lot oh. of my time. And it's very, very hard to break. Yeah. So OCD, um, I'm not an expert in it. I'm familiar with some parts of it. But from what I understand, one of my dear friends has OCD. And listening to her describe her experiences and what I've read about it from others What I'm about to say is not a clinical perspective. I have no idea if it matches any of like official OCD stuff, but 
it sounds to me like one of the biggest features of OCD is that cognitive dissonance, uh, not cognitive, dissonance, but like a disparity between like the actual danger in a situation or the actual needs of a situation and what you're internally creating or feeling are the actual needs of the situation. And, and that is a struggle. Tell me where I'm wrong. It's like, um, if I don't do something a certain way, I do it differently. Mm -hmm. Then my whole day is just ruined. Right. Yeah. So if I, if I try and change something in my OCD pattern, then everything becomes wrong. And right. inside my head, it's wrong. Like, um, I can't leave the house if there's dishes in the sink. But if I do, and I get in my car and drive away, my whole head starts to explode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... I think that there's a lot going in going on in there about like trying to trying to control it to create a sa sense of safety or a sense of of yeah. rightness that is more than what I think even you would agree in your best moments is actually needed it's probably not actually needed but i need it to be done because it gives me a sense of order and chaos yeah it's my way of keeping the world in order if it's not in order it's in right. chaos mm -hmm. yeah there that that whole if it's not in order then terrible consequences mm -hmm. that's going to eat up a lot of energy yeah, it does. I mean, it's one of my biggest things. I mean, I talk to myself in my head and I do all these things and I try and break my day up. But as soon as I break my partner of OCD, mm -hmm. then the whole world's in chaos. Heather. I'm a little yeah. un unclear about what the actual question is at the moment. It's just trying to... We're trying to gain energy here, but OCD is a huge mm. drain in energy. Yeah. And OCD is one of those things that can't be controlled. It's something that has to be done. So, yeah. <clears throat> Ian, I'm not an expert. I have some personal experience, and I've also had some experience with other people with quite severe OCD. And I think we are sort of, if you look at it holistically, your OCD is a sort of, is is probably one manifestation of many. And while you might not be able to directly manage your OCD in terms of what you do, if, even though you're, you've got the OCD, if you go and do other things that holistically will help to improve your well-being, whether they're meaningful activities physical act the more stuff that you do around the ocd the, the you will i don't it's, it's hard for me to describe but i have some experience of it and the healthier i am in general the better my well-being is in general the less compulsion i found i find so there's things that I can do easily all the time, every single day that I always do. And like you, I'm really bugged if I don't do those things. Like even the way I tie my shoelaces. Now that's a silly example, but I've got these strict patterns. But, you know, I uh, uh, this sounds really ridiculous, but when I've not not been in a good place generally, I like, I used, I used to not be able to go into a supermarket. I used to have the different carrier bags for all the different supermarkets in the car and stuff like that. And I couldn't go into that supermarket if I, you know, like I drive past it if I knew I didn't have a carrier bag for that supermarket because I didn't want to be in there without their carrier. That's a stupid example, but 
I know that that the time in my life when I had OCD really badly was when there was all other bad things going on. And I wasn't really like trying to, you know, do what we're doing here today, which is work through them. And I find that like, although you might have to do five different things to get out the door, if you go out the door and do that meaningful activity, yeah, the more you do that or the more you you address some of the stuff we've been talking about tonight, the less compulsion there is around some of it, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that's any help. Um, my OCD comes from, I was in the army. I saw some really bad things. Yeah. And I deal with that. I have to deal with that every day. And I take one pill to make me sleep at night, one pill to make me forget. Yeah. But I need to can order and control my life because if it's not in order, if it's not in control, I can't handle chaos. Yeah, yeah. of course. So it's completely associated with all of that. And it's 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 doing the things that you, you need to do to process all of that and to overcome all of that stuff. And the OCD will go away with, with it. If you you know, not saying that it's it's necessarily possible, but I think it's part of the whole thing. If you know what I mean, so like focusing on trying to control or change your OCD is probably the wrong way to spend your energy. Spending your energy on your yeah. sort of general self improvement, addressing the things you're talking about, PTSD, whatever it is. By doing that, it will help you to manage your OCD. It will fall away, I would imagine. But, I, you know, that's just from experience, observing would, other people and stuff. I would agree with that. Like focusing on trying to reduce the OD OCD itself is probably not going to be as helpful as just healing the original trauma. Yeah. And then the effects of it, which manifest as OCD, among other things, will be less intense. And I don't know where you are, Ian, but I've also worked in vet setting up and supporting delivery of veteran services. And um, the the best therapy, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. It's where you visualize things and oh, I can't remember the name of it, but we certainly trained all the therapists in Wales to deliver that and they had really good results. So I don't know if you've had any support like that. Oh yeah, the, the nice people in the army. They, I've got a full-time therapist, a full-time psychiatrist. Well, that's good. I mean, pursuing all of that is, will help you to overcome your OCD rather than just focusing every day on trying not to be as compulsive, if you know what I mean. I thought my, my focus every day is just to get through the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally get that. You are but, getting through the day I think you're you're in the way that you want, but you're getting through every single day. Yeah. You've gone through thousands of them. I mean, I think you be talked about it before, Heather, that you actually know about a bit about my background. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um I hope that was helpful. <laughs> it is. It's it's a tough one because I think a lot of autistic people, especially being in the army, it becomes a point to in the army, there was control, you had order, you had everything. But then I didn't think about it at the time, but at the time it was a peaceful situation until everything started happening in Iraq and in Central Europe and things just got a bit out of control for me. So it's, you live with it every day, but it's just trying to get through that day without trying to think about it all the time. And yeah. I, mean, I got on my phone, I got my therapist and everything on speed dial. So mm -hmm. I think and for autistic, I think I, I tell autistic people, I still tell young autistic people, if you're autistic, don't join the army. It's not good for you. Yeah. Yeah, I got bear that in mind. Different, different circumstances, yeah. yeah, but a fairly regimented environment, and I just started going along with it, and then find yourself having to do all this stuff just to feel you're all right. <laughs> yeah, I do want to get to two other questions that were asked. Um, 
who people have been very patient. Um, Hank asked, what happens when your once actually create cognitive dissonance? And I think, I'm guessing what you mean by that is when you want things that you can't have. Um, yeah, I think the the main uh, part for me was um, like I want to make some income and there's just it's so hard for me to access those different ways um, or I want to make art because when I'm making art, I feel uh, often a lot more calm and regulated and, and I can express myself. But um, there are some things that that either trigger me like I get super over stimulated because I'm too excited mm -hmm. um, or I have a trauma response to something or I'm just so exhausted and so but I find myself my my brain or my heart is like I want these things I want these things but my capacity is not right I don't or like that the idea of how to do it is not right so I'm missing the steps between mm -hmm. honor your capacity you can't you're you're not going to get out of it what you want if you're trying to push so hard that you're hurting yourself in the process um, and when you allow yourself to do less or to do it in smaller bits or not to the full extent that you want you're creating you're starting to build a trust with yourself that you're going to be able to do things and you're like teaching your nervous system that it's going to be okay in the future by knowing when is too much to stop too much to do like when to stop when is too much for me so that you don't just keep recreating that situation where you push so hard and then it it actually starts sucking and the art that you want to do starts hurting you. So do just doing just a little bit when you have the capacity to do it, working just a little bit when you have the capacity um, will create new associations in your body and in your nervous system that will allow you to eventually gradually work up and do more and more and to be able to know when is when's enough does that make sense i don't know that if makes that well so much sense i really okay. fucking appreciate it yeah very <laughs> succinct You're very well. okay there's one more question um or is it joanna i think yeah all right so joanna asked what if oops what if one of your energy drains is is also the person that you depend on because you can't live independently. I feel stuck. Okay. Uh, so one of the interesting things that I've noticed consistently is that when you start working on yourself, it changes your relationship with the people around you. When you start healing your own wounds when you start communicating like learning better ways to communicate when you start acknowledging and honoring your own needs more the people around you the people who you depend upon even ones who aren't really into that personal growth shit kind of thing um they will like especially if you can start in really small ways that aren't threatening for that other person it can change your relationship just a little bit at first and slowly 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 more and more over time and they might begin to respond to you in different ways in ways that are a little bit better if the person is genuinely toxic or abusive that's probably not going to work very well though it's possible i've seen it happen but it's less likely but if they're not necessarily like genuinely toxic or abusive, but they're just, they've got their own shit kind of thing, it, and it's not a great relationship, the relationship can change gradually over time. And they might even become a little bit more interested in 
and doing some work on themselves in small ways. I wouldn't count on that. I wouldn't like do it for that reason, but it can happen. I don't know if Joanna's still on here, but. Okay, yes. Is that helpful for you, Joanna? Is that even addressing the question that you're thinking of? And they might not change. It That's possible. But it's possible that your relationship can change a little bit. And they're sometimes abusive. Okay. Sometimes abuse is just because someone is stressed. Sometimes it's a response to a much deeper trauma history in that other person. And it's not going to be something that you doing your own work is going to necessarily resolve. But if it's just like they're extra stressed and they're taking it out on you, um, then reducing the stress in your relationship or in yourself or in your situation might be able to help with some of that. I don't know what your exact situation is. We don't need to get into the details right now either, but, um, but also like some of that, just reducing like healing your own wounds, um, doing the parts of it that you can manage can reduce your overall stress level, increase your own energy level. It might not permanently change that, but it can change other things in little ways. And it can be sometimes surprising how much those little changes can add up to over time. It's not a perfect fix. I wish I could just say, oh, do these one, two, three things and it'll fix it all. It's not that easy. I'm sorry. But but it is possible to do some things that help you out, even if it's not about changing them. Okay. So I'm going to wrap this up here. Uh, I hope this has been helpful for y'all. Even if you get one or two gems out of it that you can apply in your life, that'll be great. All right. Thank you all very much. And the recording for this will be going out uh, in the next day or two. And there'll be information on that for the next workshop as well. Okay. Have a near a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. So much. Bye, Queen. Thank you.